We'd like to do a, a teaching, if we can, uh, on the temple, and especially concerning the last temple. Uh, if, you, if you trace out the temple in the Bible, you, you can start in the Garden of Eden uh, with the creation of Adam, basically as the first temple. And then you can proceed from there to the tabernacle in the wilderness. That gave way. Then you find the temple in Jerusalem. That gives way to the temple of the body of Jesus Christ when He was here. Uh, Jesus was taken up into heaven after His resurrection and sent the gift of the Holy Ghost. And, and the whole job of the Holy Ghost at this point is to create or to build the last temple of God, which is the church. Uh, we're all uh, that are saved or called to the cross of Jesus Christ. And in that sense... Uh, God is using us as lively stones to put together a temple for a habitation of God through the Holy Spirit. And that is the, the basic uh, tenets that we're going to follow in this teaching. Uh, you're probably going to hear some things that uh, you've never heard before. Bear with us. Uh, we're going to try and go through the Bible and let God speak for Himself where we can here and try to connect the dots and, and see where it leads us. So, uh, let me give some uh, biblical facts which are to be believed concerning the true temple of God. If you trace out the first dwelling place for God uh, as the God of Israel on earth, you will find in the tabernacle in the wilderness. And there God dwelled among His people. And God is a God of order. People today don't realize that God is a God of order and He keeps order. Every part of the tabernacle that was built was a God-given instruction communicated to Moses. And the divine pattern shown uh, Him in the mount when He was up in the mountain. Uh, it says, And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof which was showed thee in the mount. Exodus 26 and 30. By the same token, Apostle Paul tells us the same thing in, uh, in his writings. And the writer of Hebrews agrees uh, in Hebrews 8, 5, where it says, Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So, they're in agreement. Everything in the literal building of the tabernacle had a spiritual significance and a typical meaning uh, for the New Testament believer. The tabernacle was God's house and therefore he had it built exactly the way he wanted it. Uh... Paul applies many of the physical things of the Old Testament tabernacle spiritually to the work of Christ in the New Testament as we see. Uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews explains many of those types and shadows. I guess there's a great de debate whether Paul was even the author of the book of Hebrews. Uh, I've always been taught that he was, although there is some proof that maybe he wasn't. But either way, it was an inspired writer. From the time of the tabernacle in the wilderness until now, God has had a dwelling place upon earth. Then said Solomon, The Lord hath said that he would dwell in the thick darkness, but I have built a house of habitation for thee, and a place for thy dwelling forever. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who hath with his hands fulfilled that which he spake with his mouth to my father David, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build a house in, that my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be a ruler over my people Israel, but I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there, and chosen David to be over my people Israel. I was in the heart of David 
my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to David, my father, for as much as it was in thine heart to build a house for my name, thou didst well in that it was in thine heart. Notwithstanding, thou shalt not build the house, but thy son which shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build the house for my name. You'll find that in Second Chronicles 6. That's the whole description for the reason that the temple was built by Solomon in the city of Jerusalem. The tabernacle in the wilderness was a temporary structure and gave way to the temple. The temple in Jerusalem was also temporary and gave way to something greater. Let's listen to God's word and his promise to David by the mouth of the prophet Nathan. And when the days, thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he shall be my son. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. You'll find that in 2 Samuel 7th chapter 12 through 17. Now this prophecy was fulfilled by Jesus Christ according to Peter in the book of Acts. Here's what he said. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, that he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. You'll find that in the book of Acts, second chapter, the 29th through the 36th verse. Now God's promise to David by the mouth of the prophet Nathan, as found in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 17, which I already quoted, had to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ as Peter has just told us. Nathan's prophecy given to David concerning the promise God has made to him that of his seed, God will set up his kingdom, build a house for God's name, and establish a descendant of David to sit upon the throne of that kingdom forever. Now folks, None of this prophecy can be taken as a literal fulfillment as far as in time. It has to be accepted as a spiritual promise. The reason being that we have here a promise that transcends time itself. To promise a kingdom, a king on a throne, and a house of God for the duration of eternity cannot be understood in the context of time. To be given a promise of God that is to endure forever and forever is to leave the finite for the infinite and to accept that promise given in time for its fulfillment in eternity. In other words, it is to accept that promise as being spiritual and not carnal, not tied to time. Jesus Christ, the Son of David, is the only one who could have fulfilled that promise that God gave to David. Paul's estimation, Christ as the true son of David, was a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Paul saw a new covenant with God's people. You'll find that over in Jeremiah 31.31. 31. There's a new covenant promise not according 
to the promise that was made to the fathers. It's a spiritual covenant. Circumcision no longer in the, in the flesh, but in the heart. The heart must be circumcised. Unlike the old covenant, which was carnal and tied to worldly things, the new was a spiritual and heavenly. The Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing which was a figure for the time then present, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. You'll find that in two places. Hebrews 8, 2, Hebrews 9, 8 through 10. What the apostle is in essence is saying is what I just said about David's promise being spiritual and not carnal. If David's promise from God were literal and earthly, then its inheritors, which are the seed, the seed of Abraham, would only receive its blessings for time. Thus, the inheritance would be a temporal rather than an eternal. Paul's teaching is otherwise. He says, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. That's Hebrews 9.15. The words eternal inheritance makes the promise spiritual. For a descendant of David to sit on the throne in his kingdom forever, that person, the throne, and the kingdom itself must be an eternal or spiritual. This was Paul's meaning when he penned Hebrews 7, 21 through 25. The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. God, through Jesus Christ, can guarantee his promise to his people as an eternal inheritance. Death has no more dominion over Christ and his seed. Now, when we were discussing the, the temple I said earlier that the tabernacle in the wilderness was temporary. It was for a time. And it gave way to Jerusalem's temple that Solomon built. I said also that Jerusalem's temple was temporary and gave way to something better. Now I will tell you what that something else was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1. From the minute that Jesus Christ entered the world, Jerusalem's temple was obsolete. I'll say that again. From the minute that Jesus Christ entered this world, Jerusalem's temple was obsolete. In Matthew 23, 38, it says, God no longer claims possession of the temple found in these words. Your house is left unto you desolate. Jesus doesn't even claim it. In Revelation 21, 3, John declares, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. So what I'm basically saying is that the, the temple in Jerusalem gave way 
to the temple of the body of Jesus Christ. He became the temple of God while walking in His ministry in Palestine. Jesus Christ, in other words, while on earth was the tabernacle of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building. Wilt thou rear it up in three days? The Bible says, But he spake of the temple of his body. John 2, 18 through 21. The tabernacle in the wilderness gave way to the temple in Jerusalem. The temple in Jerusalem gave way to the temple of the body of Jesus Christ. And the temple of the body of Jesus Christ gave way to something else after his resurrection. And he was taken up. He gave us the promise of the gift of the Holy Ghost. As you can see, we've steadily left the carnal, worldly sanctuaries of God and slowly arrived at the spiritual dwellings of God. Why? Because God's true Israel is a spiritual nation. God's people are a spiritual people. God's dwelling place is through the Holy Ghost and not temples of mortar and brick. The scripture says, Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me? saith the Lord. Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Acts 7, 47 through 51. Now I wish to make my last point before going back to what I said in the very beginning of the chapter. Jesus Christ went to the cross and He paid our sin debt. He rose on the third and appointed morning, ascended to heaven, and sent back the promise of the Holy Ghost. And the temple in Jerusalem gave way to the temple of the body of Christ, and the temple of the body of Jesus Christ gave way to something else. And that something else is still in the world, but not of the world. It is the last temple of God upon earth. It is the true church of Jesus Christ that the Holy Ghost is adding day by day such as should be saved through the name of Jesus Christ by the blood, by grace through faith. 